Let's get weird into it. Number 8. The Last Highway King Imagine you're driving down a dark, empty interstate at 3 a.m. The only thing keeping you company is the hum of your tires and the ghostly glow of the dashboard. Then, in your rearview mirror, you see it. A pair of headlights gaining on you fast. But as the vehicle passes, you see there's no one inside. The cab is empty. The steering wheel turns on its own, guided by a silent, invisible driver. You've just been passed by a ghost. A ghost of the future. For a century, the truck driver has been the modern cowboy. The lone knight of the asphalt. Hauling the lifeblood of civilization from coast to coast. They're the reason you have food in your fridge, clothes on your back, and that weird little gargoyle statue you ordered online at 2 a.m. But this cowboy is riding off into the sunset and the horse is taking over. Long-haul trucking is a perfect job for a machine. It's repetitive, it follows a predictable network of roads, and frankly, humans are the bug in the system, not the feature. Your fragile human body needs sleep. It gets distracted. It needs to stop for greasy diner coffee and to complain about road closures. An AI-powered truck, on the other hand, is a relentless beast. It can drive 24-7, communicating with every other truck in its fleet, forming a perfect, optimized convoy that slips through the night like a river of data. It doesn't get road rage. It doesn't need to listen to 18 hours of angry talk radio to stay awake. It just... goes. The companies developing these systems aren't just building a better truck. They're building a logistics god, an all-seeing network that can calculate fuel efficiency, traffic patterns, and delivery times with terrifying precision. Your package will no longer be in the hands of a guy named Dave. It will be a passenger in a rolling supercomputer. So the next time you see a trucker, give them a friendly wave. They are a dying breed, the last generation of humans trusted with 80,000 pounds of steel and momentum. Soon, the only thing left of them will be legends and the automated horn of a ghost truck, still politely tooting for kids by the side of the road. Number 7. The Burger Bot. You're hungry. You stumble into a fast food joint, craving the specific, glorious trash that only a greasy burger can provide. Behind the counter, there's no moody teenager, no weary line cook. There's just a thing. A sleek, multi-jointed stainless steel arm that moves with a silent, terrifying grace. It glides. It flips. It assembles your burger with a precision no human could ever match. It doesn't breathe. It doesn't sweat. And it will never, ever spit in your food. Meet your new chef. The fast food cook is a job forged in heat, grease, and pressure. It's a chaotic ballet of timers, sizzling patties, and shouted orders. But in the cold, hard calculus of business, chaos is expensive. Humans are messy. They need breaks, they get sick, and they have bad days. A robot doesn't. A robot is a perfect employee. It shows up for work 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and its only demand is electricity and the occasional software update. Companies like Miso Robotics have already unleashed Flippy, a robotic arm that can handle the fry station and the grill. It uses thermal imaging and computer vision to know exactly when a patty is perfectly cooked or when fries are golden brown. It's not just flipping burgers. It's performing culinary surgery. The result? Perfect, consistent food every single time. The human element, with all its beautiful, unpredictable flaws, is being engineered out of existence. Your burger will be mathematically perfect, but it will have no soul. And it's not just burgers. Robots are being designed to toss pizzas, mix salads, and even brew the perfect cup of coffee. The kitchen of the future isn't a place of passion and artistry. It's a clean, quiet, sterile factory. And the only sound you'll hear isn't the sizzle of a fresh patty hitting the grill, but the faint, unsettling whir of a servo motor assembling your nutritionally optimized calorie block. Number six, the human copy-paste. There is a special kind of purgatory, and it's called data entry. For decades, this has been the quintessential entry-level office job. You sit in a beige cubicle under the hum of fluorescent lights, staring at one screen filled with messy, handwritten forms, and typing that information into another screen filled with neat, orderly spreadsheets. Your brain slowly turns to tapioca pudding. Your soul leaks out through your fingertips. You are, for all intents and purposes, a biological script, a flesh-and-blood copy-paste function. And that's exactly why this job is about to go the way of the dodo. Why pay a human to perform a task that a simple piece of software can do in the blink of an eye? Optical Character Recognition, or OCR, is the technology that allows a computer to read text from an image. It's been around for a while, but it used to be clumsy, like a toddler trying to read Shakespeare. Now, powered by machine learning, it's a speed-reading genius. 
It can decipher your doctor's horrifying chicken scratch handwriting, pull relevant information out of a crumpled receipt, and file it all away before you've even finished your first sip of coffee. What once took a whole department of people days to complete, now takes an AI a few seconds. It doesn't get carpal tunnel. It doesn't misread a three as an eight because it was daydreaming about the weekend. It is the perfect tireless drone this job always demanded. So while we celebrate the end of one of the most mind-numbing jobs ever conceived by humanity, there's a chilling thought. This wasn't a job that required creativity or critical thinking. It just required a human to act like a machine. And we've finally built a machine that's better at it than we are, officially making us obsolete at being our own dollar store version of a computer. Number five, the bank teller's smile. When you walk into a bank, what do you see? Marble floors, long lines, and behind a wall of bulletproof glass. A person, a bank teller. For generations, they were more than just cash dispensers. They were a point of human contact in the cold, abstract world of finance. They'd ask about your kids. They'd help you figure out a bounce check. They were the friendly, trustworthy face of an institution that held your entire life savings. That face is vanishing. The first blow was the ATM, a clunky robot that let you interact with your money without having to talk to anyone. It was convenient, but it was just the beginning. The real killer is the supercomputer you carry in your pocket, your smartphone. With a few taps, you can deposit a check by taking a picture of it. You can send money across the world. You can apply for a mortgage while sitting on your toilet. You have become your own bank teller. The very concept of a physical bank is becoming a relic. They are expensive cathedrals of commerce in a world that runs on digital whispers. Why pay for rent, security, and salaries when an app can do it all for a fraction of the cost? The few tellers who remain are being retrained as relationship bankers or financial solutions specialists. Fancy terms for a salesperson trying to upsell you on a credit card you don't need. The personal touch is being replaced by a personalized algorithm. Your banking app knows your spending habits better than your own mother. It will send you a cheerful notification about your credit score, but it won't ask you how your day was. It is efficient, it is secure, and it is completely, utterly impersonal. We've traded a human smile for a push notification, and we barely even noticed it was a deal. Number four, the AI whisperer. Okay, enough of the doom and gloom. Let's look at what crawls out of the primordial soup of our discarded jobs. And it gets weird, fast. Imagine a new kind of artist, but instead of a paintbrush or a chisel, their tool is language itself. They don't write for humans, they write for gods, digital gods. This is the AI prompt engineer, or as I like to call them, the AI whisperer. We're building these incredibly powerful large language models, AIs that can write, code, and create art, but they're like a genie in a bottle. They have infinite power, but you have to ask the right way. If you give them a lazy, vague command, you get gibberish. But if you know how to talk to them, if you can craft the perfect prompt, you can conjure magic. A prompt engineer is a strange hybrid of a poet, a programmer, and a psychologist. They need to understand how the AI thinks to know which words will trigger the most creative or logical pathways in its vast neural network. They're trying to communicate with a mind that isn't a mind, a brain made of pure math. A great prompt isn't just a question. It's a piece of art. It has to be precise, evocative, and sometimes wonderfully strange generate a photorealistic image of a stoic octopus librarian in a sunken Victorian library, cinematic lighting, a sense of deep melancholy. That's not a search query. That's a spell. In the future, the most powerful people in the world might not be the ones who write the code, but the ones who can speak to the code. They will be the translators between human intent and artificial creation, the ghostwriters for the machine. They'll be crafting the marketing copy of tomorrow, the legal documents, the blockbuster movie scripts, all by whispering the perfect sequence of words into the ear of a silicon brain. Number three, the body farmer. This is where it gets squishy. You're getting older. Your liver, after years of questionable life choices, has decided to retire early. In the old days, you'd be put on a transplant list, a grim lottery where you wait for a stranger's tragedy to become your miracle. But in the near future, you'll just order a new one, custom made for you. Welcome to the world of the organ engineer or the tissue farmer. This isn't science fiction. It's happening right now in labs. Using a combination of 3D printing and stem cell technology, scientists are learning how to grow human organs from scratch. First, they create a scaffold, a kind of biodegradable organ-shaped jello mold. Then, they take your own cells, so there's no chance of rejection, and seed them onto the scaffold. 
They put the whole thing in a bioreactor, a sort of high-tech oven that mimics the conditions inside the human body, and they wait. Your cells multiply, they grow, they form tissue, and after a few weeks, you have a brand new, fully functional liver, heart, or kidney ready for transplant. It's your own body part, just built outside your body. The job of an organ engineer will be part biologist, part engineer, and part artisan. They will be crafting the most complex structures known to science. They'll have to worry about blood vessel placement, tissue density, and making sure your new kidney doesn't come out looking like a modern art sculpture. This will change what it means to be human. Death will no longer be a matter of organ failure, but of whether you can afford the replacement parts. We'll have warehouses, not of car parts, but of human parts, each one grown to order. It's a future where your body becomes a machine with interchangeable components, and the mechanics who fix it are called farmers. Number two, the digital archeologist. Your great-grandmother dies. She leaves you everything, including her old laptop from the year 2026. It hasn't been turned on in 60 years. You try to boot it up, but the operating system is ancient. The files are in a format that no modern computer can read. It's a digital coffin, locked forever. Who do you call a digital archeologist? We are creating more information today than ever before in human history photos, videos, emails, memes. But digital information is incredibly fragile. Hard drives fail. File formats become obsolete. Cloud servers get shut down. The entire record of our lives is written on a canvas made of magnetic rust and fleeting electrical charges. In a thousand years, a clay tablet will still be readable. Your Instagram stories? Not so much. A digital archeologist's job will be to excavate the ruins of our digital past. They'll be part historian, part hacker, part data recovery specialist. They'll have to write custom software to emulate ancient hardware, crack long-forgotten encryption, and piece together fragmented data from corrupted drives. They won't be digging in the dirt for pottery shards. They'll be digging through a virtual landfill of dead links and obsolete code, searching for the ghost of a forgotten social media profile. Imagine them trying to make sense of our world, trying to decipher the cultural significance of a doge meme or understanding why millions of people watched videos of a cat playing a keyboard. They will be the translators of our time, explaining our bizarre digital rituals to a future that will find them utterly baffling. They will sift through the terabytes of our digital junk, looking for the tiny, precious pieces that tell the story of who we were. Number one, the nostalgia curator. The future is here. You can travel to Mars in a VR headset. You can have a conversation with a perfect simulation of Abraham Lincoln, you can taste foods that have never existed. It's a world of infinite synthetic experience. And you are desperately, profoundly bored. You miss... something. Something real. Something imperfect. That's when you hire a nostalgia curator. This is the ultimate luxury service in a world saturated with artificial perfection. A nostalgia curator's job is to design and sell authentic, retro human experiences. They are the masters of recreating the past. Not as it was, but as we want to remember it. They don't just sell you an old object. They sell you the feeling that came with it. Want to experience the thrill of using dial-up internet in 1998? They'll set you up in a perfectly recreated room, complete with a beige CRT monitor and that iconic, screeching modem sound. They'll even simulate the excruciatingly slow download of a single, pixelated image. Want to remember what it was like to go to a video store on a Friday night? They'll build a perfect replica, stock it with VHS tapes, and hire actors to play the bored cashier, and the guy who always recommends obscure horror movies. They are memory merchants. They'll research the exact smells, sounds, and textures of a bygone era, the specific brand of cheap beer your dad drank, the feeling of a clunky plastic video game controller in your hands, the distinct disappointment of a movie being out of stock. They are selling you your own childhood, carefully curated and repackaged for a premium price. In a future where anything is possible, the only thing that will be truly valuable is the memory of a time when it wasn't. And that's our time for today. More strange things are always coming, so I'll see you in the next one.